So, um, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Katarina Jerbic. Um, I am a maritime archaeology PhD student at Flinders University in Adelaide, uh, South Australia. And today I will be talking about the archaeology of the core and more or how the Holocene marine transgression um, thank you, um, affected the prehistoric population in the Adriatic Basin, which is uh, my PhD um, project. Um, a little presentation breakdown. Um, first of all, um, I will be talking about the site called Zambratia. Um, I will give you a little bit of site description and research history, um, some cultural connections that I'm trying to um, connect with the climate change, and the new research I have done for my PhD, um, and with some ideas for new research, and of course, acknowledgement and um, bibliography. Um, so my site is called um, the settlement in Zambratia Bay. Zambratia Bay is located in the um, northern Adriatic Sea on the very tip um, of the Istrian Peninsula, um, where you can see it here. Um, it is a submerged site, um, um, three meters underwater, and it is um, supposedly, um, which I will try to prove to you and in my PhD, um, a submerged pile dwelling settlement. Uh, that was originally placed over marshland or a lake. Um, so um, it started in 2008 um, when the archaeologists from the Archaeological Museum of Istria in Pula um, st um, had to um, do a, an archaeological prospection of um, this bay because there is a Roman villa just nearby this embankment and they, um, by the law of Croatian um, cultural heritage, um, every time there is something happening, any kind of um, uh, construction work near any type of archaeological um, heritage, uh, there needs to be an archaeological um, prospection of the site. So the maritime archaeologist um, did a prospection of the bay and they actually found three, uh, three underwater sites. Um, one of them is a, a Roman road, which is submerged. Um, the other one was a Bronze Age boat, uh, which is the star of this um, bay, obviously, and there is a lot of research done on this boat. And then the third one was a, a series of um, piles, wooden piles, that were protruding out of the seabed. There were more than 100 of them, and um, also there was a lot of ceramics scattered around the surface, and also um, an area about 20 to 60 meters of um, submerged peat, which is a, um, a kind of um, sediment that only can uh, become, that can only be developed in uh, brackish or um, lacustrine environment. So the underwater investigations on this settlement um, were conducted a few times by the Archaeological Museum of Istria of, from 2008 to 2014. Um, there were total station servers, bathymetry, and uh, six test trenches, and they have one radiocarbon date from the site. And in 2017, um, I organized a series of investigations um, for my PhD research with Flinders University and the Archaeological Museum of Istria, and we did seabed coring, uh, wood sampling, and uh, we have six radiocarbon dates. So this is the bathymetry of the site. Uh, as you can see here, um, the site is located here, and it is um, actually a submerged uh, karstic sinkhole, um, and it is protected with natural limestone ridges, and the um, actual piles are located around the edges of those ridges, and the uh, peak platform, you will see a bit later on another slide, is around here. So. The depth is um, more, more or less three meters um, underwater. So this is the site, um, and this in this red triangle um, um, thing, <laughs> you can see the uh, peat area. So this is the peat area, and this is actually these are actually pictures of the peat, as you can see here. Um, and the piles are all around here, and there were a few trenches. Um, they dug out by the Archaeological Museum of Istria. Um, the site itself looks like this. 
it's not very easy to see, but when your eyes um, get used to it, you can see more and more of the piles just coming out and protruding out of the seabed. They're not very big, but um, once you get used to it, you can see them. Um, and also there's a lot of uh, just wooden planks um, on the seabed, a lot of pottery, um, and more types of um, archaeological evidence like this um, grinding stone. Um, so the cultural connections, um, obviously on this uh, picture here you can see there's a lot of um, ceramics that can be defined, but um, I had to pick um, for this presentation something, so I picked this type of ceramics, which is the Nakawana style ceramics. Um, it is very typical for the Eastern Adriatic, um, late Neolithic and early Copper Age, and it is um, usually just um, black and um, it is the decoration is um, channeled. So it's black and um, smooth with channels, uh, and this type of um, um, perforations are also very typical for Nakawana style pottery. Um, the prehistoric pottery styles in the Eastern Adriatic um, are, so these, this is the table, and the um, Nakawana pottery um, usually appears around 4000 to 3000 BC. Um, the other cultural connection that I will talk about today is the Alpine pile buildings. Um, the closest ones are the ones in Italy, Austria, and Slovenia, which are all parts of the um, prehistoric pile buildings around the Alps, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. They are set in the Alpine lakes of Austria, France, Germany, Italy, Slovenia, and Switzerland, and they are famous for the 3,500 year long tradition of, from Neolithic to Iron Age, from around 4,300 to 700 BC. There are three um, known main periods of abandonment of these sites, which will become uh, important in this discussion a bit later. And these one Zamratia preliminary date that we had was 4,230 till 3,980, which fits into the both Nakawana style ceramics and the Alpine Pablo's cultural influences. So for my research, um, I chose to do um, seabed coring and um, dendrochronology and um, kind of combine the two and make um, some kind of connection to the climate change in the past. Um, I organized uh, in 2017 a series of investigations with the main aim of research will, uh, to use the history of sea level changes because it is a submerged site um, as a context for an archaeological study of the inundated site. Um, the material culture insinuated um, two significant prehistorical influences and they were both reinforced with the radiocarbon dates that um, were also reinforced with later radiocarbon dates, as you will see. So this is a bit small, so I um, just picked the part that is important to this discussion. Um, I did have eight cores done, uh, but um, I only choose, chose two because I didn't have much time for my PhD, but um, hopefully the other ones um, will be a part of my postdoc or any kind of publication in the future. Um, I also, um, uh, here with the yellow marks, uh, are the um, trenches from uh, 2008 to 2014, and the red um, area is where I took wooden samples for dendrochronology. Um, the radiocarbon dates um, in 2008, we have one wooden pile from trench one, uh, which is the one here. So this is trench one. Um, this is the pile that was in the seabed and uh, the archaeologists took it out and as you can see, it was um, planted so they could probably put it in the, in, in the sediments a bit easier. And then in 2017, um, we had the red area um, and um, did uh, an archaeological uh, perspective of the area. And, five minutes. Um, and um, we have a 63 year old oak tree sequence with dates that are, um, con con um, that are complementing the dates from before. This is the um, radiocarbon dates from these tree, um, from the trees. Um, and also I picked two cores, and this is a bit small, but here you can see, um, you'll see the dates after, but um, this is 
um, from 151 centimeters to 154, which is 3,246 uh, to 2,882. And it is a marine sediment. And under it, um, there is um, um, lake sediments here. Um, and it is uh, 3,832 to 3,775. Um, we have another one, which is a bit strange, and it represents one of the limitations of my research, because it seems like as if uh, they are upside down. Um, but they are still Holocene and could be useful for the sea level um, change interpretation. Uh, so this one is, um, the upper one is, appears to be older, which is 2,226 uh, to 1,781. And the lower one is 70 to 227 AD. Uh, as a recap, we have the one wooden pile with the Nakorana pottery and live stream pile blowing um, dates. Uh, we have the piles that are complementary to these dates. And then we also have these dates from the uh, cores um, in, on the site. And um, in the end, I felt like something was missing. So I went back and took um, the samples from another core, which is Sandra Tia 7. Um, I don't have a nice graph for this, but I will show you the pictures because there's a very interesting thing happening. So these are all marine sediments. Uh, you can see here, these are the centimeters, and this is seabed, and this is 280 centimeters under the seabed. Uh, here, it starts to look more brackish, and it starts um, having um, an order of peat. Uh, and here, we had, I had, I found um, um, a layer of um, ash, and in that ash I found pottery. It, it was actually prehistoric pottery. Um, this is the ash that I found the pottery in, and I also found the pottery um, not that nice as this um, before, but um, I have three more pieces of pottery in the core. Um, and then we have some wood and more ashes, and the, um, the sediments become uh, completely peaty and very dry. And then after that, it suddenly stops and they uh, become uh, lake mud sediments. Um, this is very um, exciting for my research because I will have to, um, I um, have new radiocarbon dates to come from this core. And hopefully this will be a nice connection to both the uh, dendrochronology and the radiocarbon dates from other two cores, and I will be able to um, compare the sediments from each core and do a nice seal of change reconstruction, hopefully um, uh, giving a new uh, answer for climate change archaeology. These are just acknowledgements, splinters on a frost, um, and um, this is Christian, who is the local fisherman, who helped us with everything, my social media, if you have any questions, and my email, bibliography, and thank you very much.